The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Zurich Australia Limited, ABN 92000 010 195 AFSL 232 510 and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hi, I'm Andrew Rocks from Ensemble, and I'm thrilled to be bringing to you uh, the podcast Engine Room. It's devoted entirely to the practices or the business of the business of financial advice. Over the course of the next many months, we're going to be interviewing Australia's best independent boutique advice firms, their practice managers, their GMs, on what environment is conducive to being a best practice how they keep talent, how they attract talent, and what the future of financial advice is. It's the Engine Room Podcast. Welcome aboard. Zurich is proud to be supporting this episode. The Zurich and OnePath Advisor portal is more efficient than ever before, giving you access to two leading brands with three highly sought-after products, underpinned by two powerful underwriting engines, all with one simple sign-on, making it easier for you to do business and perform at your best. Hi, my name's Andrew Rocks, and welcome to another Engine Room. We're getting to the stage in financial services where there are some firms that uh, are delivering on the promise, um, the promise of being able to get to a size and scale where they can give lots of people lots of different opportunities. And today I'm joined by Ian Rogers, the GM of Nesworth, which is a relatively new name, um, who's creating something pretty special um, in financial planning. Well, welcome to the engine room, Ian. Thanks, Roxy. I'm really happy to be here. And um, as be uh, our normal cadence... Businesses are businesses, but they are based around the people behind them. So maybe give me a feel. I know you've been with the Nest Wealth Group, um, Nest Wealth Group for for some time, um, but maybe give me a bit of an idea of what the hell got you into financial planning because it wasn't the first thing you did. And I'm interested in sort of a bit about your backstory and how you've come to being where you are today. Oh uh, wow! Well, I got into the advice game. I, I actually came from a small business background. I'd had a few small businesses in different areas, um, uh, uh, mechanics and, and restaurants and things like that. And Wow, so you know how to work long hours? I managed to work out a way not to work the long hours. I, would, <laughs> I think small business is harder now, but I'm, I'm, a bit, I'm an old guy, so this is a long time ago. But we, we um, it was, you know, funny, it was a long time ago. We were talking in the um, 90s and I'd sold some businesses and was looking around for what to do with my money. I'd um, blown a few um, proceeds of businesses that I'd sold when I was very young and learned that I needed to do something with it. So uh, I did talk to a couple of planners and didn't have a great experience back in those days. So like a lot of small business people do, I thought I'll do it myself. And I went to study, which was what was the Securities Institute back then. Yeah. And so I, I, I'd been myself. And as part of that, I'd met some People um, were working for what was the Lend Lease Group back then. Uh, it was the origins of the MLC Group, and I'm not sure what quite happened, but I was engaged and excited in the industry. I um, became a financial planner for a few years, and as is the want when you're a small business people, you like controlling stuff. And next thing, I was going through some management positions. Um, I ended up in the NAB group. They acquired uh, MLC and everything took off from there. And what year was that when you did your financial planning initially? That was 1999 um, back then, yeah. So, so we had the um, we had GST was probably the scariest thing that was happening in financial planning at that time. Is that right? Well, it, it was. There was a lot going on. And, and you know, it, like a, a lot of advisors had done some really good stuff at that time and we were starting to get into goals-based advice and uh, I remember there was a lot of arguments about fee-for-service versus commissions and all the rest of it and you know we I got had a great experience because we effectively came into a fresh business then and we were able to start with a clean slate around some of those things and you know some of those really early lessons have carried through um, forever for me through the through the career so and, yeah. and what, what, what give me one or two of those lessons 
Uh, it was the big. I remember we were going feed for advice, and I remember everyone saying, "You can't do that." Well, you can if you don't know anything different. I'd come from businesses where you provide a service, you invoice it, you get paid, and um, and, and everything was pretty transparent and upfront. And sometimes when you're coming in green and not knowing anything different, it really helps. And uh, well, and, and also we listen to ourselves, right? The clients were always going to pay a fee. It was us exactly gazing right. <laughs> with our own colleagues, wondering if they would, right? <laughs> Totally, and once you get a bit of scale and momentum doing things like that, you realise you know you can do it. Everyone can do it, and and um, from that, I got really enthused about the coaching game in there because I love people not telling me they can't do it or we can't do it. You, you absolutely can, and then, so I think coaching is always been a thread in my career as we're building businesses. So um, in relation to coaching, I suppose some of those you mentioned that you you you, you were successful early in, in selling some businesses, then you've gone in and you've made a few. A few failures, and um, and and look, that's the whole purpose of this podcast is that hopefully people that are coming through in their twenties and thirties now listening to this, um, the gift that us old blokes give to the next generation is learn from our mistakes. So, um, but then when did you get into? Um, so you're working within the um, uh, the NAB group effectively. Um, when did you get back into the small business side? Well, I, I did a career of twenty years. I, you know, I was I've got nothing but um, good things to say about the NAB group. I got opportunities overseas to start, run, buy, sell businesses, run some big licensees here in the country as well. Yes, we made mistakes, but we had great support. You learnt a lot, and um, and that was great. We it was um, two thousand and nineteen. I'd taken a break and was looking forward to not doing a, a bit for a while and um, then this business we now call Nestworth came along. We started doing a little bit of consulting work with a great colleague of mine, Paul Fogg, that I'd worked with for a long time. We came in the business, actually, that we know Nestworth has been around for 32 years and um, the owners were looking to get out. We were doing a little consulting work um, and it was good for me. I up getting back into the small business dynamic. It was, I think, around 18 staff or something then and had a few... Um, challenges like a lot of businesses that have been around for a while had and we we were doing a little bit of work and gearing up for a sale of that business and I don't know what happened. We got excited and thought about all the things we could do. <laughs> so um <laughs> it's, it's so if you, you were you were involved in that business you were teeing up for a sale. Where was that? Whereabouts was the business predominantly? So it, it was only it was Bris, Brisbane Gold Coast but so South South Queensland only. Yeah. yeah. So a Brisbane business you're like, oh okay, I'm thinking of selling it. 18 people, didn't quite happen that way, did it? Well, no, we, we had a look and, and both Paul and I are quite like-minded, had a look and the the business had um, great bones, great DNA and some really good principles around some of the things that we'd always struggled when we had funding for bigger businesses to implement stuff like um, basic stuff that really matters, like solid cash flow management, understanding those sort of things. It was doing it really, really well. So we saw an opportunity to build a a um, framework of all of the good things we'd seen. I, I've been absolutely blessed to work with hundreds and hundreds of businesses over the last 20 years. I've seen the good, bad, the indifferent, um, and taking all of those learnings into what was a great shell, knowing we need to do a lot of stuff um, around technology, people, um, at clarity around the business. But uh, we got enthused and um, we we got into it and uh, ended up, running the business, um, owning part of it, and that's been a big journey over the last five years. We've had a lot of change. It's been good. And um, I noticed that um, you you grew up in Brisbane. You, you educated in Brisbane. I try not to interview Brisbane people or Queenslanders for about two months of the year <laughs> around state of origin time, but um, uh, we'll put that on there. And if you mention anything, I just will edit it out. So, um, And uh, that won't be a problem. But um, yeah, what about personally? Um, um, you've been there. You've got you've um, maybe given an idea of what you do outside of work. Uh, well, I live on the Gold Coast and embrace the Gold Coast lifestyle. I mean, I've, I've, I grew up in Brisbane, moved to the Gold Coast as soon as I had a driving license and could could ride right. the Goldie. Um, I love surfing back then. I've uh, been involved in surf clubs. I'm still very involved in our local surf club. We've always had a big community bent throughout family, and that's one way I can give back. Um, the Gold Coast has been a great base for me. I've always had national roles, even when I was self-employed, we had a national presence, but um, it's just been a really good place to bring up a family. When you're flat out through the week, and particularly when I've always been traveling a lot, it's great flying back in, you feel the settlement, you can disconnect and enjoy family and lifestyle. So um, yeah, so 
my, my weekend is predominantly uh, involved being with my three kids, um, somewhere or another being in salt water, whether it's surfing or life saving, and um, just enjoying life. And it's 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 good that the Gold Coast has had a pretty functioning airport for most of your career as well. So um, you know, as, as far as as non capital cities, it's probably the next best as far as transport. It used to be really good. I used to get on the 6 a.m. flight three days a week, get there at 20 to 6 and still walk on. You can't do that these days, but it's still pretty good. Still pretty so good. Um, but, but, uh, this, I'm not sure much of the aviation industry gets this, but um, to the people in Jetstar, you know who I'm talking about. So <laughs> we, can, we, could have, we could do with a bit more. So you've got, you've got this stage. Yourself and Paul um, have, have looked to, to sell this business. You had a bit more fire in your belly. I do see... You know, a commonality, people who are involved in stuff, whether it be surf, life saving, cycling, charity, whatever it is, tend to just be, you know, uh, energetic people that others are attracted to. So maybe explain to us, you know, where is Nestwell today in 2024? Okay, so we've grown, we've had a fair few acquisitions. Look, we've, we've, I've always wanted to grow stuff. I think that a lot of people do. And um, we, we quickly came up with a plan around the business. We got excited. Um, with what we could do with it. And, um, you know, over the last five years, we've got, uh, I think we're around 89, 90 staff now. We're about um, 17.5, 17.6 mil revenue. Um, as I said, we just hit our 32 year birthday and we're around 3,800 clients, I think, some, somewhere around there. We've now got seven locations as well. So, we're so, a lot. Rattle them off. I'm going to come back to a few of those numbers. Where, where are you located? Where's Where's the business? Uh, two in Victoria, the Malvern, and, and um, we're just moving into some new premises right now in the CBD. We're Sydney, Canberra, uh, Gold Coast, uh, Brisbane, and we've just opened a Sunshine Coast office, which we think is a great growth area for us as well. So... You know, a few years ago, you had your own team, and you've 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 obviously managed to attract people to buy into your vision. What do you think that you guys bring to the table on a regular basis to to attract not only people to work for you, BAU, but for other business owners to sell quite often their life's achievement in, and be part of your organisation? Well, we've been really clear on our vision and everything that underpins that. We 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 were clear on that right from the start because. Um, I can get in front of, you know, we, we have been growing, so we've had to employ a fair few people and um, we want to employ the people that share this vision. So we've got to be able to articulate that. So it, it's interesting. Before we do anything, I will sit down and I, I do get enthusiastic about what we're doing, what we're trying to do. I, I talk about the technology we're embracing, where we see ourselves in two years' time, because in the end, that's what people, they're, they're buying into a lot of stuff, but they're buying into our ability to realise that and what that looks like. I am the first to admit it'll be slightly different in three years from what we painted on. We can't control everything, but um, we're taking everyone on that journey. We want everyone to take that journey with us and they need to understand that. So that's been the really big thing for us. And I also get for some employees or, or, or business owners looking to join us, that's not always right. But if we get that clear, we can we can flush that out. That's It'll... totally agree. If you've got, we've got no goals, you're never going to get anywhere, right? So you might get a little bit of variation um, from from what your vision is. So, so um, uh, thanks for giving me those numbers as far as people. So your vision has been bought into by 89 or 90 people. You can't work out if that person's um, in or not. So if they're listening, if, <laughs> if you're the most recent eye, you're still on probation. So uh, you might want to be nice to Ian for a few more months. Um, the So what's the vision of the business? Because... Um, you know, you, you you've got thirty eight hundred clients. You're in multi jurisdiction. You've, you know, is there a is there a particular way that you? Um, well, I'll reframe the question. What sort of clients do you have, and what are what's the sort of ones that you ultimately like doing? So uh, our target clients are quite different. As you appreciate, being 30, 32 years in business, we uh, we've got an aged client base. That happens if we're successful, and and we do. And that's one of the challenges actually that we've got. Our target client, though, we're pretty clear on that, that they're 35 to 50-year-old families, ideally with dual incomes. We love them with kids and mortgages, the challenges that come with that. Um, we like people that have dreams and aspirations, don't know how to realise it, and um, and we can help them work through that. I know that's not the target market for probably the predominance of uh, Australian planning firms, but we've got a really long-term view around that, and we've proven that we can 
established relationships for 30 years with family units. And we've also worked out how we can bring value to those clients and we can we can realise that value ourselves over time. So we like solving problems for everyday Australian families and, and that's clearly who we're after at the moment. That's how we build our processes. Um, we rebranded last year to Nestworth and that rebranding exercise was all around around that. Well, I'm glad you said net's worth because I've said net's wealth tw- twice, and I'm my, my I'm, I say <laughs> Kieran, the sound guy is already giving me two strikes on the swear jar. Well, the great thing about this interview is this that my life's passion, um, building my financial planning business, was exactly the same. Announcer was a business that had wealth accumulators. We had about 3,500 clients. Um, we offered the other services, so I'm really keen to sort of rip into you know how you are going about things like cash flow. Uh, management for the clients, debt management, genuine estate plans, you know, the dynamics of intergenerational transfer. So um, when when your clients, let's talk firstly about sort of how a client comes in and what typically the steps are. And then I'd love to hear, once you've done that, how you arrange your people, you know, what the org structure is. You're in multiple locations. Um, yeah. So so if I'm a client, I'm a Let's assume that I'm under fifty. I just disclosed that I just turned fifty, so um, I'm, it'd be I, hopefully my, my better looking wife um, uh, allows me <laughs> in the door. But 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 what what does a client journey look like very quickly um, with a, with a couple? So, so we we um, we've got a philosophy around um, we want a lot of consistency in how we deal with clients. So all, all of our staff are salaried staff. Um, yeah. And we support, we'll, we'll approach clients in a similar way for the things that are important. We employ our staff for their talent and we want to make sure that they've got the room to exercise that talent with clients. But what they will do when they come through, they'll experience is we're pretty clear on the nest worth way and what that um, means, the sort of things that we do, the philosophies that we'll run through the business, what they can expe- expect with us from an experience perspective. That might be the number of times they'll talk to us through the year. It'll be our philosophies. We'll, we'll summarise the philosophies on how we manage money. We don't focus, we deliberately don't focus a lot on things like um, investment philosophies and all the rest of it. We don't want to get caught. That, that's our bread and butter. We do that, but we don't hang our hat on that. What we do talk is strategically in a big way about what we do with our clients. And well, um, in, in 20 years, when they've all got three million bucks each, then you probably uh, have a lot more attention. But uh, right now- you're in the business well, of getting them organised. Well, we do, and back, you know, when they've got that, we say we told you so. But it, it's we, we want them to understand the value of the strategic work that we do with them and the disciplines that we can bring in with them, and um, that's what we've been quite strong on for a long, long time. So we'll we'll take them through that. Um, we we do bread and better, butter financial planning, but we really do focus on some of the things that matter. The clients can struggle with. In the end, we still need them to have surplus cash flow to be able to do anything with and we do do a lot of work with that we don't sweat them through the year on that but we do spend a lot of time setting them up like that so that we're all really clear on what the client obligations are in the relationship and what our obligations are to deliver and do you use any technology or any cash sort of system in relation to doing that yeah we do so at the moment we utilize money soft in terms of managing and so we we will um we, we clearly want oversight over what's going on with their cash flow. Um, so we use MoneySoft. We've just migrated all of our clients utilising the open banking system, CDR, um, so that we're quite clear and that's made it a lot easier for, for clients from a perspective of us understanding their transaction data, their balance data and all the rest of it. Um, there's a lot of work we do behind the scenes on that. We don't we don't present that to the clients. We try and simplify things from a client perspective. And really what we're doing is just saying, we said we'd be here through the year in terms of cash flow. We're actually here. Let's have a discussion about what that means. And, you know, what, one of the things I've seen over my career is um, it's been very, very hard to, to um, deal with what the industry calls cash flow. We make assumptions when we're going into a plan. We know those assumptions will be wrong. And yet we don't do anything. We don't reset every year. We maintain the same strategies and assumptions. We keep that quite dynamic. So if something's going wrong, we can intervene. If something's going way right, we can intervene and um, update the clients on their progress, not just on their cash flow, but everything that impacts as well. We think that's really, really important. So we we do do a lot of work around that. And it gives you gives you a, you know it gives you that visibility again. Years and years ago, I used Macquarie before open banking existed. 
um, Macquarie CMT back in the day was sort of the the next best thing that you could have oversight over your clients in bulk, and um, uh, that worked really well. And and also year on year they could see themselves, especially if they were getting dividends or rent or whatever it was, actually getting ahead. So yeah. it made them feel good, right? So yeah, um, exactly. Um, and uh, maybe give me an idea about because. With that open banking, you also have quite a big debt arm as well, or mortgage advisory. How does that how does that integrate into the day to day cadence of of the financial plan per se? Well, it's really interesting. We, I think the best way to summarise it: if, if I was running a business, um, I guess capital management is everything. Managing cash flow, but also managing um, debt and and access to capital. We kind of pick that up and place that across clients' personal situations. They need to manage their capital. And for a lot of clients that present to us, they've got debt. So effective debt management's really, really important and the impact of cash flow on that. Um, we won't use those terms with clients, but that's how we will explain the, the system to them. And um, that's really important. We also know that clients, most clients work on visuals. Um, yes, we hit them with a statement of advice and we hit them with all the projections and everything. The thing our clients value is several times a year, we'll present them with graphs. Um, clients in our dynamic, um, they're interested in how their debt's getting controlled versus what we said we'd be able to do, what's going on with their cash flow and what's going on with their investments inside and out of super. We will present that graphically to them, which fuels the great deep conversations that we have with them through the year. So um, just just harping back to um, your your team are salaried employees, so they're very much buying into the vision of the process. Your debt team's also salaried, I, I take it. So so does the client journey? Um, uh, if I'm a client, do I or if I'm a practitioner, do I do I do a part of the client journey, or do I have a client from forever? Or how, how if I'm working in your practice as a planner, for instance, am I sharing that information? Um, and keeping the client the whole way through, or, or what? How do no, that's, that's right. Yeah. So everyone. So the 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 principal uh, relationship manager is our financial planners for sure, and then we've got the other arms that assist. So we've got mortgage brokers in house. We didn't particularly set out to be a mortgage broking business, but we found that it's very hard to control the well, the strategies. We had too many implementations that went wrong and, and impacted the strategy. So we brought that in-house and that's worked really well. It's also taken the pressure off. We get them to focus on on the strategy that's sitting there with when they're implementing um, the mortgage broken products. And that works really well. So they're just a team. They're just an extension to the yeah. team. And the clients see that as well. It's um, they're, they're not seeing that they're dealing with different sections of our business. It's just another arm. We've um, We've got, it's interesting, we've got an in-house accounting business as well that we don't own and we don't employ. We've just welcomed them into our business because they share culturally the alignment of what we do and we treat them exactly the same way and they're fantastic. They're a, they're a great business and um, they've become fully integrated without us even owning them. Um, are they, are they branded yeah. the same? Are they branded the same? No, 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 they're not. They're, they're MJM is the um, the firm and we decided not, it wasn't in their interest or our interest to acquire them, but we can help each other in different ways and they're fully integrated. The only thing we can't do is share, share data, obviously, but we do do share data on, and, and you know, data has been a big thing for us, controlling data, and um, that helps us smooth things over for clients and that's really important. So, um with uh, your thirty eight hundred clients, maybe give me a bit of a feel of how the advisors, you know, how are they organised per advisor? And if, does the advisor have um, what support is around the AR? So are they in a, a, a sort of a, a hub? So or, or yeah, maybe give small. me a guy, give yeah. me a feel for that. So they'll they'll work in small hubs of typically three advisors. Now we we do that for a few reasons. One is um, we're really big on flexibility for our staff. If someone wants to be able to take a six week holiday, that's awesome. They've got a team sitting around them that also understand the clients to a degree and can step in and, and help. Um, originally, we just we weren't in teams like that, and that became really hard managing that. Um, they also see themselves as little performance units as, as well, and our support backs around that. So we typically might have three, um, three advisors with one support person internally, and we've got an offshore team that supports us as, as well with VBR, and that works really well as well. So, and they're part of our team. We we don't view them as a outsourcing service. They're actually part of our team. They join all of the meetings, and they all own the client outcomes. Yeah. So, 
Um, so you've got, uh, if I'm an advisor, I've got that support. Domestically, I've got some implementation support overseas. Um, I've got some power planning, the combination of domestic and overseas as well, I imagine. Um, when you mentioned that they get in a little performance thing, does that mean that um, each one of the teams have their own sort of short-term and long-term uh, targets? Look, we have targets. It's, it's a really interesting thing. I've, I've done a, a lot of, we, we all think about targets a lot, and we do have performance targets with all of our people. We do a lot of work to make sure we understand what their individual aspirations are, and ordinarily they're a lot more than what our business targets are, and we like that. If they're driven by that, you know, it's not solely about what they want to earn, it's about what their lifestyle looks like as well. We spend a lot of time talking with parents about that. Well, um, we're there to fuel our we appreciate that they just don't turn up to work because they want to work. We want to provide a good workplace, but they're also turning up for us to fuel their family outcomes and everything like that. So we do talk a lot about what that means to them, yes, in terms of uh, remuneration, but also balance of lifestyle and, and everything like that. And um, they, they share that. The, the teams that work together are typically the same in terms of age, demographic, aspirations and things like that. They get on, they support each other, and they drive each other. And um, so how many acquisitions have you made in the last, say, sort of three or four years? And do typically the people you acquire stay on for a period or do they leave or, you know, what, what's the what's the norm? So what's the historical fact? And then uh, we spoke earlier off air and you said, yeah, you're interested in always doing this exercise. So maybe yeah, yeah. start with, with the ones that you've historically done um, and talk about the future state, please. Yeah, so we, we, we've acquired three advice businesses and a uh, uh, mortgage business. Um, so we're fairly flexible. We obviously want owners to stay on and join us. And we've had a bit of a mix of those that love what we're doing. They might have grown typically to a point where it gets hard. They're great advisors. They love dealing with clients and suddenly they're dealing with all the people issues and the operational issues. That's great because we can take that. We've got a set up. We can take that away yep. from them and we want them all to stay but we're also cognizant that you know everyone's selling a business or a practice for a reason and some of it's because they've got a couple of years left in the industry for whatever reason and we're quite accommodating about that but we just have an individual plan there and make sure that we've got the clients at heart so if we need to hand over clients we typically will do a two-year journey there we're big enough that we can run a few professional year advisors at a point in time so we've always got that flexibility where we can um hand over clients we don't like disrupting client relationships but it's clearly going to happen at times so we've got a different different arrangement with all of the businesses that come into us depending yep. on what the, the staff need and want and um uh next you know we're just sort of changing years to be a bit more punchy on and so who, who, who are you licensed with Bornham. Bornham. okay and they've got a new co coming up which is their name this is a, a quiz first book you've got to say it then I've, it's got a lot of eyes in it so uh go for it entirety and i think i've got that right you have you've enunciated it correctly so so uh yes uh, we don't need to edit that out so um and and i interview quite a few practices in in the fortnum and and the previous you know that's a now a combination of of of, of australian unity and and um i believe that that story was also your story maybe give us a bit of an oh, idea yeah. of what recently yeah. happened so back in november we were Sailing along, and in actual fact, we'd done a, a, a big um, piece of strategy. We'd assessed where we're at because we had bought a few businesses. We confirmed that we originally thought, well, we might like a presence down the East Coast because what we do, we thought we did well and could take to other cities. Uh, we decided there was so much opportunity in Southeast Queensland, we'd stick there. And three weeks after we did that, um, the opportunity came up to acquire the Australian Unity salary business and we had to move fairly quickly we had plans for a rebranding um sometime about now thankfully we've done a lot of the work because we had to rebrand quite quickly before uh the australian unity uh sale was executed so we took on the australian unity salary business obviously it came with a licensee pfs um, we had a very good strong relationship with fortnum and they took on the pfs license so we're, we've actually got staff that are dual licensed across them at the moment we don't envisage that'll happen forever because that provides some challenges, but that's what we've we've got at the moment. And um, yeah, that was one of the things we're at a size now where we can move quickly, be flexible, and we took on took on that um, salaried business. They are okay. great to a point where you know we've got really good staff there. And they're that listening to you now, Ian. So, you, so <laughs> they're as good as the rest of the team. But, um, so and that's they've 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 effectively been 
um, in the team now for six months or so. Is that right? Or That's six months. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. Well, part of how you've been able to move fast is that um, you uh, have a capital partner, um, uh, and uh, maybe give the spinners a bit of an idea of 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 who your capital partner is, um, how they operate. You know, what's the what 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 is what's the bits that um, uh, you like, and what was the surprising bits of, of of being in business? And full disclosure, one of my other businesses has shares the same capital partner. Yeah, yeah. So we 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 work really closely with um, AZNGA, and we we spoke uh, about it. I guess a year, a year and a half after Paul and I had been involved in the business, we knew with. The well, hang on. There's, there's, there's now twenty Pauls involved in the conversation. Uh, this, sorry, this Paul Pond. <laughs> yeah, yeah and, 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 exactly. There's a lot of Pauls around the place. You're you're right. Um, we we knew we would need some sort of capital partner to be able to accelerate things. Um, the plans that we had would typically probably take you twelve years, and we weren't that patient. Um, and we were talking to um, to AZNGA, and um, you know we deem them to be the the right partner, and they've proven it. it's really interesting. It, we view uh, all of our relationships as partnerships. It doesn't matter whether it's capital partner, platform partners, tech partners. We really do look at it from a partnership. We're interested in their strategy, where they're going, um, the sort of things they're trying to achieve, and you know, it resonated with AZNGA. And um, why? We had a- why that? Why? What was the thing? What? What did? What was the vision that you bought into? Yes, cash is cash, right? We'll put that absolutely. It, you need it. But it wasn't a vision. Was, yeah, yeah. So, um, Paul Barrett was really excited about what he could do differently. Could he articulate exactly what it was going to be? No, but neither could we about our business. And we needed someone for flexibility, the excitement, and the trust to share the the journey with us. And that's what he brought to the table. Um, it, and, you know, it's been good and flexible. They are quite trusting in terms of us running our business and decisions we make. And um, if we're after growth, which we have been, and, and we've been quite strong on that because, we, you know, we've got a strong belief if we're not growing, we're – we're shrinking, and um, that that gets really, really hard. And the game's changed a bit over the last five years. And that we had to have a certain scale to be viable, and and make sure that we were relevant to our clients. And and, and AZNGA have shared that as as well. So they've been a really good partner for us. And um, you know they've been able to accelerate a lot of the growth, and also a lot of the tech um, changes that we've brought through the business as well. So let's let, let's um let's let's pivot on to you mentioned it's good to have partnerships. You mentioned capital partnership, and you've spoken about A's in J. And if I was to add my two cents worth, um, doing business with people that have done hundreds of mergers acquisitions when most small businesses might do four or five in their lifetime, it just brings that element of experience, which is you know which is very very important. But platforms, are you talking about investment platform? Maybe give a shout out to the the people that you like working with and you're progressive. That would be awesome. Yeah, so so we obviously we're a fairly big business, so we wouldn't be a platform in the country. We haven't got a, a fair amount of money with, but they're all listening, uh, mate. When they saw your name come up on the podcast, <laughs> they're like, "I wonder, I wonder which way Ian's rolling." So yeah, well, well, I will, I will, I will give a story. So a lot of it's been about efficiency as we grow. So um, so we we had quite a complex um, investment philosophy and structure, and the way we implemented. it. Um, things was like a lot of businesses at the time. It was inefficient. Estates were happening, and and it, um, it was quite complicated. So we knew we needed to move to a managed account structure. We bit the bullet on that three years ago. Um, we went out and started interviewing platforms. So we knew where we were starting. We landed with Hub Twenty Four. We could have gone with a couple, but what we were interested in was their strategy. Like a platform's a platform. We could have done it a lot of places. We were interested in what they were doing with data, how they aligned to us, where they saw themselves sitting in five or six years. Yes, we've landed the managed accounts with them, but um, but we're also excited about what they're trying to do in terms of strategic alignment, and that's primarily why we landed with them. We could have gone with a few others that we interviewed. We certainly will be doing business with them into the future. So that that's where, from an investment perspective we've done the bulk of the bulk of our activity over the last couple of years and um that's been great and the nature of your client base um you would be one of the you know as you mentioned not that many people in financial planning have focused on that on that demographic of the 35 to 50 year old but you're not only you peak debt you peak life insurance requirement so um do you have a, a structure for your life insurance is it done by the planner is it is it done by a specialist team and who do you use it's done so 
we will use everyone with with that. It's it's obviously the complexities that have worked through the system over the last five years. We've been really busy the last couple of years, particularly on the IP side of things with everyone else. But um, we definitely keep it in house with the planners. Now the complexity obviously has led us to challenge: should we have a specialist unit and uh, we've decided no because it's really hard. It's a bit like our, our mortgage advice, our debt advice. It's really hard to separate that out from a cash flow perspective, an integration perspective, and you can end up with conflicts internally. We did do that for a little while and realised quite quickly um, that we were going to end up in conflict. So we just spend a lot of time on education, making sure that we're technically sound internally and give um, comprehensive advice on every occasion. Yeah. So I imagine um, every single client would probably have insurance requirements. It just depends on whether their incumbent is doing the job or whether they need something from from your portfolio. Correct. That's, that's exactly right. So um, thanks for that. And there's yeah, there's some BDMs crying at the moment. Um, okay. um, we know we're open for our business, so uh, that was their their little their little their little hook for, to keep listening. So um, and then tell me about your tech uh, tech stack because you mentioned tech partners was the next sort of partnership that you were very invested in. That has been the biggest piece of work and it's been enduring. So we had- Does enduring uh, mean painful? It has at times, but it's been rewarding at the same time. It, it, it certainly goes on and we're, you know, we're finalising. We'll always be obviously looking at our technology. Now that we've got a really, we think we've got a really strong baseline where um, we're, we're now looking at what we can do with it. But we recognised early that control of data was really, really important for us. We effectively had a lot of stuff. Um, if we jump back five, six years ago, we were internally very self-sufficient, but we we're almost like a, a, a software house, the way that we were doing things. Um, it was good. It was flexible, but we were taking ourselves down a path we didn't want to be. So we decided we need to start again on everything. The first bit was really understanding how we want to control our data. Now, we, we've ended up, what, what I referred to as our data like we use Zappo and um, so we use them there CRM controls our processes but really importantly that's how we control our data as well and then we started building things around that I mentioned before that we use money soft to feed transaction data and and banking data through um, that comes into the the data lake um, we do use Xplan from a advice construction but it's interesting we don't need to have a lot of licenses the way that we run things. Um, Zeppo does a lot of the heavy lifting on what we otherwise would need licenses for. So we do use that to, um, to as an ad- advice tool. Um, but I think we've probably backed off on about 60% of our licenses over the last four years. Um, and that's been a good journey from a cost control perspective. Well, it's um, wonderful that um, Iris isn't sponsoring this podcast. Uh, so uh, I'm going to say that would have been a clean edit. Uh, okay. No, well, I mean, look, the, the reality is, and so, so Zeppo is your, is your workflow management um, effectively is, as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, do you use just curious? Um, do you use the the Zeppo to um and and the, the to po- populate your uh, your apply online for your debt as well? We when you're doing at the, your... at the moment, so that's it. One of our next stages we've got to get to. So, um, you know, at, at the moment, um. We our aggregator is AFG. Yep. We use their flex system, and we can feed data in there. So we've got insights. Everyone's got insights. So lots of going on with the clients. That's our next piece of work to you know see what we can do. But we you know we, we're we're using we're using a combination. Yeah, my prosperity, as I said before, we use from a um, a, a client portal perspective. That's what well, no, you hadn't you hadn't you hadn't brought that up before. Um, I had um, part, part of the hub, yeah. part of the hub family, um, and and. You know, when I look at the the front end ones, you know, you'd hope that the billion dollars of hub behind them um, do the job. Um, and ultimately, with whether it's flex or whatnot with your aggregator, you can actually over time you'll be able to push information from that software back into your financial planning software, which will, you know, make sure that it's it's up to date. Um, we're just starting to do that now, which is which is good. Yeah. So yeah. Oh, good, good. And um, so uh, when I have a look at you've got your teams there, um, because you've got people in different locations in Australia, and you've got people in different countries. Um, what's the common thread about um, uh, managing those people in those different locations? You know, what's the cadence as far as meetings? Uh, you know, you're a big team. It can get unwieldy. But, yeah, well, what does a day look like? So the, the dynamics, dynamics change a little bit since we've now got offices around the country and we've taken on 
the Australian Unity team. Um, we've obviously we've got another layer in there at the moment. Now we've we've tried to we, we have been really flat and hands on to date. Uh, it's gotten a bit big for us to continue the the structure. So we've got a uh, a couple of great people, our regional managers, that will look after those teams through the week. But we try and make sure we've got consistency. So each week we'll have a consistent team meeting across our what we call our north and south teams um our individual advice teams including our client support we'll have a couple of short sharp meetings every week which are focused on clients they're not focused on themselves it's focused on clients um we 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 do have uh, like a typical advisor meeting we separate out the topics that we're doing because we want to talk about clients and performance um, if you try and merge operational issues, you find those meetings become operational. So we, if we've got an operational requirement, we keep them quite separate and we keep our disciplines around those sorts of things. Our meetings are short, sharp. We're not in the business of doing business with ourselves. It's the clients that matter. So we make sure we try and limit the meetings and just keep consistency and make sure that they've all got the data that they need to do their job as well. And um, and digitally, do you use Teams or Zoom? Or- yes. Teams, we, we use Teams. So we went, um, it was really interesting. We'd just done a big migration to Office 365. I think it was 15 days before COVID hit and we all had to run home. We got the time in perfect and we've been on Teams ever since. And we're just now uh, starting to explore that from an efficiency and automation perspective for things like auto file notes and all the sort of stuff we can do now that we've got things Control. So I, I think we'll be sitting with that. We're, we're certainly building out around the Microsoft 365 suite. Well, um, I can't wait in looping back in a year and, and finding out how you've gone because um, we went to 365 and, in fact, BBP uh, is moving moving there as well. <clears throat> and um, I'm there in another a couple of my firms um, with ones with 60 in the, in the business. And what we've also just turned on is Copilot for internal meetings. Change the world. So we're just piloting um, that right now. So good. Yeah. So good because you know what often happens, Ian, is that sometimes in a uh, in an internal meeting, an operations meeting, yes, decisions are made, but the person, whether it be your regional manager, still has to enforce those decisions and make sure people are accountable. But that duplication of actually sending out who has to do what job being done automatically is just so awesome. So, so we're really excited about yeah, that actually yeah. because it's um you know we, we also everyone's talking about AI and all the rest of it for us it's it's about yes it's about efficiency but it's about the accuracy and the consistency that we can bring to the business and our, our people and um so we will be quite different I think in twelve months about how we're using that we we're, we're really fortunate you know we're big enough that we can have a dedicated technology team so. That, when I spurt out an idea or someone else spurts out an idea, we can actually be looking at implementing it the next day, which is really helpful in our business. Every time someone says they've got that, I don't know if you've seen the, the show, The IT Crowd. It's an old BBC show, classic. So anyways, are listening, uh, the turn it on and off again gag from the uh, the tech team is probably there. Now, what I wanted to ask was, um, you're a salaried business. So the way in which financial planning employment has uh, ended up in 2024 is um, the tide went out on the banks. You know, a lot of people I speak to cut their teeth in the banks um, and they're all salaried and they learnt there and then they've gone out and they're self-employed. A lot of people want to be self-employed, but I think earlier you nailed it saying a lot of people like being a financial planner, but no one likes having to remember to pay the electricity bill. You know, um, has there's actually someone who comes around and empties your bin in your office you've got to get a contract for. So there's lots of other things that some people don't like doing. So with your business, Nestworth, um, what I want to know is why do people join you? Why do they stay and, and how do you grow with them? Um, look, I guess they join us from two two reasons. They, they um, I employ them as individuals and they definitely join us for the journey where we're heading and quite often – We've found in the last two years, it's, it's interesting because I've spoken to a lot of people say it's really hard to find good people. We haven't found that. We really haven't. But I, Why is that? Why is that? Um, look, I, if I was <laughs> going to put something on it and back ourselves in what we do, I think it's because we've got our strategy right. We can articulate that. And in the end, we employ a lot of younger people. And now that's a that's a challenge because they don't bring necessarily experience. Uh, we bring a strong coaching and support program so they can see how they can grow, but they also see what they're growing into. And typically, a lot of the staff that we bring on from an advisory perspective might have three or four years, maybe five years experience in a firm. 
where they can see what needs to be done, but the firm's not of a scale and doesn't have the capability to do those things, to modernise, to to bring in some of the, the, the tech bits that they're all reading about. If they can see we're doing that, they can see the promise realised and they they will join us. Um, so that's that's when we're recruiting people. And then from a business perspective, um, it, it's it's more about how can we align. So we'll typically do a an introspect on the the individual, what they're trying to achieve. We are interested in their business, but in the end, we'll find out what's going on, right or wrong, in their business. But we're really interested in the people that are coming in, and we'll do a call apart about. What success means to them personally, what we can bring in, we'll try and get an intersect on that. And that's when we know acquisitions and mergers can work and we've got that intersect right. So it's probably two different approaches there. The business strategy don't where we're heading is important to both. And um, I'm looking at I'm looking at your your pictures of all your people there. Um and so what you're saying is the fact they look young isn't just someone with an over enthusiastic account on Canva, just uh, making them look younger. They actually are younger people. Well, we tend to, I guess, because we've been a bit dynamic, and um, and we we tend to attract that. I, I can't say that we're going out to attract those people, but they're the ones that tend to. It's the talent that tends to come to us, and certainly gets presented to us um, from recruiters that we partner with as well. Um, I can tell you, we've got some old heads, though, and they're really valuable too in terms of um, passing on the subtleties of this game, which has been. A bit of a challenge, I think, for our industry over the last 10, 15 years. But the ways of um, the ways of learning have certainly changed. Oh, absolutely. So um, another key facet of what you need to bring to the table to not just attract but grow your people is is sort of like additional training. Um, and what are the areas? So if I'm a, a new AR, so I might have done my PY and I'm, I'm, I'm either looking or I'm in your business, I do my personal plan with you. And as you said, some of that's financial, a lot of it's um, there, but some of will be training and development. What are the training and development things that that you guys bring to the table for a a thirty something year old looking for a ten to fifteen year career minimum with you? Well, three things. There's obviously the the technical side of it that gets looked after, and we we do do a lot of that internally. Share it. We've obviously got the licensee support and everything else that goes on along that. That that's not hard. That bit. Um, there's we do a lot on the business side of it because people, if they're invested in our business, they're really interested in it. So we do do a lot of work and education and share what we're trying to do, the financials, industry dynamics. We share the challenges that we've got because it's really interesting. Most of our staff are quite interested in in that and what it takes to be successful. I think if every young staff member, I think all of them in the back of the head have got an aspiration to be a successful business person. The more they learn, often they realise they don't want to be be that, but they've all got it in the back of their head. So we we do a lot um, on you know just educating around the industry while we make the decisions we do, and then there's the other bit, which is the client engagement bit, the soft skills, the the stuff that'll accelerate their success with clients. Oh, tell me about that. So you so this because I I started ninety four and um and and soft skills were were I suppose you know it was probably. One third got soft skills, one third practice management, one third tech skills back then, and then with the the rise and rise of compliance, um, it, um, it it really it smashed those. Um, mm. The what are you doing in the soft skills? I'm very interested. Do you internally, or do you bring some external people in from time to time? No, we mostly do it internally. We're lucky that we've got a few people that like myself that are passionate about it. We've seen it. I'm, I'm, not an expert in every area, but I've had the opportunity over my lifetime to make all the mistakes. Um, I am old enough that my first job, I was thrown the white pages, the paper version, and told to make calls, learn how to book appointments before you learn how to give advice. And, you know, some of the skill sets we all used to get by doing that, it's not achievable now. So we we bake that into some of our processes and talking about why we do the things we, we do. We focus on hitting the keynotes and things like meetings and understanding why you need to do that, just the simple stuff like getting positive affirmation from clients before assuming you can move on, all those little skills that we all used to know. Quite often, um, I guess you had to learn them through the, particularly if you're giving insurance advice, and a lot of that's dropped off recently. We do a lot of um, we do a lot of joint meetings. I do observational coaching and things like that so that we can pick things. All of us, when we're in a busy meeting, having success, you miss the things you do wrong and we, we, we analyse those a fair bit and we 
um, we share a lot internally. We've got a lot of experience and we use it. And so one of the interesting things about the cohort of clients that you're after is quite often you're not competing against other people for their business. You're competing against them doing things proactively in a time frame they otherwise wouldn't. So you, you kind of, how, uh, how do I best put it? You're kind of making sure that they're well aware of the fact that if they take the steps at 40, by the time they're 50, they're better off. So there has to be some soft sell, um, you know, bringing forward decisions without being overly salesy is has to be part of what you do. Well, well this gets to the, the big thing and, and um, you know, the, the hardest part, but the best heart part and the enabler to getting through to clients is peeling apart their aspirations. We know every single client in the demographic in which we're working, particularly if they've got families and stuff, they have dreams, they have aspirations, and most of them look at their situation and go, they're going to stay there, they're going to be dreams. Um, and what we're trying to do is bring those dreams to fruition. If we can't deliver them straight away, we'll tell them when they can deliver it, we'll be robust about what they can't do. But So we spend an awful lot of time, that's, that's the picture we paint with clients, is we are going to peel that apart with you so we understand what your great life looks like. We, we talk about, uh, you know, what we deliver is richer living, um, not richer in this financial sense. It, it's about being able to live every bit you want to of your life. Like, you know, a lot of clients talk to us about, you know, when I'm 15 years, I want to do these holidays for five years. When the kids are off my hand, it's like, why do you want to do it when the kids are off your hand? Well, we don't. That's when we can afford it. And we'll go, well, if we can make it happen with your kids, is that better? Yes, and that, that's how we enable. So we don't dump, we don't jump into the finances with with our clients initially. We we jump into their personal circumstances, what they want to achieve, and sometimes advisors find it hard to to do that. We we, you know, we talk about goals based advice, but if you don't, it's a different between goals and aspirations. And success for us is understanding the aspirations, the key drivers for our clients. So if we've got that right, they'll be clients for life. Well, I can tell you unequivocally, the reason why the goals-based advice um, hasn't been embraced by as many people as probably should is that um, businesses that don't have scale can't deliver it properly. It's, it's hard. It's hard if you're in a smaller business trying to straddle all of those disciplines that you need to keep a dynamic, a dynamic couple, right? Because a wealth accumulator couple is not like a retiree. They're not set and forget. Things happen positively and negatively every three or four years. So- so I think that the the intention was always good. The second thing is some people just haven't charged correct fees. They've they've yeah. mismanaged their own. I think you put it correctly. Your own cash flow, your own capital management as a business owner is probably first and foremost. Now, um, do you use any recruitment um, people uh, to get people? I mean, obviously hundreds of people will be ringing you after this. But in the <laughs> absence of speaking to me, um, is there any other methodologies you've used? No, we, as I said before, we. You know, we build trusted partnerships. So the predominance of our recruiting obviously has been in the Brisbane and South East Queensland areas. So we've had a long standing relationship. I'll, I'll say that it's Ricks and Eddie and Sanetti recruiting. Now, the reason that we work with them is they deeply, deeply understand what we do and they bring to us the right people. So I don't have to do a lot of filtering. Um, what I do is make sure that there's a, a match in personalities, aspirations, and all the rest of it, and generally they've got that right. I, I don't have the time or the willingness. Like I've, I've actually run a recruitment section when I was at, at the, the bank. Um, we've probably probably recruited six, 700 people in my time. We don't have the time to go filtering through everything, so it's really important that that partnership perspective yeah. bothers us. And again, they understand what we want. Um, and there's a there's a strong link there right from the start. So, and I think that's another reason why we haven't had too many challenges in bringing great people to our, our businesses as well. Well, that's how you attract them. And we spoke um, off off air before. Um, you're in the process at the moment of, of making sure more of your people have a share in the game going forward. Is that is that an inner belief um, of yours? Because you're going to have some people that have come in through acquisition, some that have come because they like the vision, but ultimately. Would it be fair to say um, that, that that having a share in the game with your team members is definitely uh, something you guys believe in? Uh, totally, totally. So we, we build that into the remuneration structure with our, our staff. The thing that they control positively and negatively is revenue for us. Um, we, we've got um, policies, views and beliefs about how we should charge clients and we, we do that and how much we should charge clients. Um, it's their relationship, their execution that delivers that. So we do 
share revenue uh, with them from that perspective, just like they're a mini business owner. And we're just working now on a um, an ownership plan too because the thing we got great feedback from is they want to own it. They understand their vision and they want to own a piece of the action, small or large. So we're just working through that at the moment as well. Yeah, look, and you're scratching that itch of, of being able to be, you know, technically brilliant with clients, not have to worry about day-to-day running of a business, but also sharing the upside in growing a fantastic enterprise. You know, that's the <clears throat> that's kind of the, the, the nexus that you're sitting in. Um, and for business of yours turning over $17 million today, to double that revenue um, and to double the size of your business, which I believe is one of your aspirations. You haven't given me the time frame yet, but uh, what's the time frame you'd like to double it? Three years, Roxy. 36, 35 months by the time you listen to this, everyone. So, so in order to do that, you're going to have to do almost D, all of the above when it comes to recruit good people, you know, get excellent tech, get excellent platforms, uh, remunerate people fairly, incentivize uh, people who, who do the work, those sorts of things. Um, do you, uh, you know, just changing it up in relation to your business, do you guys um, have any sort of charities? I mean, you mentioned earlier about your own passion piece, the the surf life saving. Is there any charities or anything, any tools that you allow your team members to to give back in any way? It's really interesting. We're revisiting that right now. So the dynamics changed with now that we've gone national. Um, we've had we've had and I dropped that question on you three months after you absorbed a whole other business. So exactly. apologies there. <laughs> no, 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 because we, we've actually we've actually got a dedicated team setting up to understand what that looks like for us now. Because it's been a really important part of this business for the last twenty years is engagement, giving back to community um and and we recognize that there's a lot of bits of this business that we um we talk about respecting the past the dna that carries through and that's one of the bits that's really really important it becomes a whole lot more difficult when you're national to come to that in a consistent way so we're just we're working through that at the moment and i'd say it'll take us another 10 weeks or so to land what we're going to do but we also support people to do stuff in the community, whether it's working with a surf club, a, a charity, um, Meals on Wheels or whatever it is. We we celebrate that when it's going on. We also like our people to be really active. We celebrate um, uh, uh, activity. Now, that can be sporting success, pushing people physically into things they haven't done Um and we think that's really, really important too. So we've got um, members of our team play soccer together, basketball together. That's all being fueled out of the business. And we love that. We talk about that at work. We talk about that on Monday mornings because it's, it's bringing us together, but it's making sure we're well-rounded people as well. I'd say a funny story on that. So um, I had an internal um, soccer team and basketball team as well years ago. And um, we we're looking for, uh, and we were supporting the McGrath Foundation and uh, we wanted to make it fun. And I can't remember the metric, but it was something like we'd donate, call it 500 bucks a goal that we'd score. But we also would donate if people scored against us. So um, when we'd get the, um, when we'd go to the charity, they, they wanted to know, were you really good for the season or really bad? Because either way, it was, it was a winner. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, but that was that sort of novelty uh, thing created just a bit more engagement we found, which was, um, um, and sort of blended those things in as well. Um, in relation to um, the uh, the industry, so let's 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 maybe give you a bit of a platform. <clears throat> You've got a, a particular subset. You're growing the business of a business, right? So, um, you, you, you it's, it, is GM the correct title for you, Ian? Yeah, it is. Yeah, yep, yep. it's funny we don't use titles internally. I know, but we yes, it is. Yeah, yeah. So, but 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 I mean, this is that's what you know. When we started the Engine Room podcast. What ultimately I wanted to do was make sure that the people, um, the people who are running the business, the business came out, and you know, and there are some of those people are more shy. You're clearly not, mate. I can tell you that for free. But um, some some of those people have great stories, and and you know, our whole industry really now more than ever relies on good systems, good in, good motivations, good people. Um, where do you see? Uh, so where do you see the future of financial planning practices? Given that you're definitely going in one direction. Do you see that that's the only way, or can it coexist with other business models? Oh, no, totally. We we talk about this within the Azen NGA group. There's definitely different models. We're definitely going down a, a path. We are a business that loves advice, loves what the advice industry can do, and we know we've got to harness great people, great technology, and a lot of enthusiasm to be able to to do that. That's that's fact. But you can deliver that in different ways. 
we obviously are clear about our target market and what we want to do. So we'll be doing different things that will appeal to our, our demographic and we'll build different skill sets. Our technology will go on a different path to do that. But we also know there's other businesses. And, you know, we, we do talk talk to a lot of businesses that merging potentially with us and and, um, and and joining us. And often those businesses will peel out. We'll introduce them to someone else in a network that we know where there's a better a better fit. I think in the end, it, it's about the aspiration and pride for this industry and what we can do. We've, you know, we've taken a knock around the chops um, for a little while there and we um, we think we can really show what we can do. There's a big space in the middle at the moment and that's what we're trying to fill. So what kind of, I mean, put you on the spot here, it is we've done a fair bit of conversation around the sorts of team members that you like to bring into your practice, you know, the, the, the training and development, the whole thing through. But if I'm if I'm sitting there, whether it be South East Queensland or indeed national as we speak, thinking that um, uh, I'd like to be involved in a bigger group. I've got a business. Um, you know, is there is there a type of business that you think you do best with bringing into your business? Certainly, people with a growth mindset. If if they can um, aspire to keep going over the next few years to grow grow it out and be able to. Um, open to change management. That's really, really important. So we, we've got a, a tech stack. We've got a belief set in what we do. We're not rigid around that, but but it's really important. We can't have people operating totally differently, but we're quite open-minded around that. So um, having a growth mindset certainly helps. Um, we do get excited about what we're doing and where we're going. And um, we talk to a lot of a lot of people that get excited about that as well. So we're, we're talking to half a dozen businesses right now, and it's that appeal and that intersect that that happens. Um, we we talk about we we don't expect people to join us for the next decade. We know that doesn't happen. We um, but the next couple of years, if they can join us on the journey, we're really excited about that. Now I'm going to just play devil's advocate for a second, um, because you said you, you're interested in people in a growth mindset, but some practices out there. Who are selling have someone maybe in their sixties and maybe uh, could be a family member or someone else in their forty forties or thirties. Definitely, the 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 person who's younger has a growth mindset, but if the person who's older might want to be exiting. So, how do you handle those? Well, that's the beauty of our model. We can do that, and as long as we've got talented people in the business that we can furnish and support through. So, we've had a couple of instances where owners have effectively. Um, Exited stage left within eighteen months, but what we've done in those eighteen months is work with the talented staff in there to pick up the client relationships and us being able to fuel their careers as well. So that's not necessarily a problem if you've got a um, single person, a, a key person that does everything in the business. That can be an issue, of course, but um, that, they're not the businesses we tend to be talking to. They've um, they've grown, they've got some great staff, and the, the generally the owner wants to look after those staff as well. So um, that works quite well for us. Oh, look, and to be quite brutal, if you're if you if you've got your own business and you haven't got any support staff, you you have a you've bought a job, you don't have a company to sell. So if you're out there and and you want to change that narrative, then um, probably be uh, give give a few other people a call and, and and or maybe listen to a few of these podcasts. I think they give you a pretty good instruction manual there. So um, look, I've I've had a, a great time um, talking with the business. I I got such a deja vu, a, a really big business interested in wealth accumulators doing the debt side, the cash flow management side, very dear to my heart personally. Um, you know, uh, yourself, Ian, an individual that, that 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 has some common themes across both AZNGA, VBP, um, you're with a great, great licensee from what from what I've... Uh, well, look, I actually get most of my information about licensees from the practice managers and from, from the companies underneath them. So that's where the truth is, right? So mm. um, I hear nothing but good things um, and... And business such as yourself is testament for that. So um, I'd like to thank you for your time. Um, I'd like to wish you all the best in your 36-month journey to double the size of your business. And look, Kieran, we're going to keep um, some links here. We've got some links around um, uh, some of the people these guys are using. We're also going to do a bit of a call to action. There might be uh, something we'll put on the Talent Hub, Ian, which gives people uh, an overview of sort of the roles that you did and puts a bit more meat behind well, you know, we are looking for people here, that sort of thing. And, and, and if that's the case, then you've had a good good listen to Ian and his his team. And um, But getting back to the reason why um, we did this podcast was to highlight the fact that finance, team sport. And if you don't have a good team, 
helping you deliver that advice, then then your clients are losing out. And um, we need as many happy clients out there telling the general public and the other stakeholders that we're awesome people because um, we've had a long way and, and, and uh, to come. Um, so, Ian, thank you very much for your time and uh, wish you all of the success. Cheers, mate. Really enjoyed it. Thanks, Walter.